Good morning. Good morning. We want to welcome you this morning. It's good to see everyone. We trust you had a good week, and we're glad that you've joined us for worship today. I'll wait just a second to welcome the guests because they're the ones everybody are greeting. <laughs> but we do want to welcome everyone this morning. It is good to see you here, whether you're here in the auditorium with us or you're joining us through live stream. We're happy to have you. We're also glad to have guests worshiping with us today. It's always a treat to have you in our service. And if you are a guest, the bulletin has a little flap on it. And if you don't mind tearing that off, completing it and placing it in the offering plate later in the service and that way we'll have a record of your attendance with us today but it is good to see each of you here uh, we're thankful that everyone's here this has been a very busy week in our church and we do want to say thank you to all those who pitched in and helped in so many ways uh, we had the associational senior adult revival and luncheon here Wednesday and it kind of stretched our limits but we were able to accomplish it and everyone did a wonderful job and we are appreciative of that as well. You also see the announcements we have in the bulletin. Hope you'll pay attention to those. Other than the ones that are listed, I believe the youth are having another fifth quarter fellowship uh, this Friday night after the ball game. It will be at the Ford's lot on Bayou Oaks. No, it's on Joe White, isn't it? Continue down Bayou Oaks until you hit Joe White Road, but Sharon will have all the information about that. But that will be immediately following this Friday night's ball game, so all our students are invited to go to that as well. And you see you have a mystery trip on Saturday too. Tuesday night, all throughout our parish at supposed to be at every single school from that has kindergarten through the university public or private there will be prayer walks ours uh, we're hosting the one at Lakeshore Elementary School and it'll be at six o'clock so if you if you're closer to another school and want to go there and pray or you want to come to Lakeshore and pray but do this as we just bathe our school system in prayer, even you know those who are homeschooled. Prayer is so important for things. But uh, that will be Tuesday night, and then on Wednesday morning is the See You at the Pole, and each school has a different time, so your child or student will need to check with their school to see what time that is. But this is something that's happening all across our nation, and as we all know, prayer is so important and so needed in our schools today. And it's kind of disheartening to have an opportunity to be at our schools and pray and then two or three people show up. And hopefully others may be praying at home. But uh, do, if you live close to a school, just, just step over there Tuesday night and, and, and pray for the teachers and faculty and students and just everyone involved. But that'll be Tuesday for the prayer walk and Wednesday for the see you at the poll. Then I want to call your attention to our prayer request for those who are sick at home or in the hospital in need of prayer. And we do want to continue to remember the family of Miss Gail Shepherd who passed away this week and others in our church who have lost loved ones in recent days. And then also to remember our missionaries who are celebrating birthdays today. But let's just go to the Lord now in a time of intercessory prayer where we lift up these and others who are on our hearts.
Good morning. It's good to see all of you. Let's stand and let's sing this morning. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it this morning. Let's lift our voices. Today is the day. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. Trusting in what you say. Today is the day. What why you sound good this morning? Today is the day. Today is the day you have made.
but it's a reminder of what it takes for us to be saved. With baptism, it's a reminder of what Jesus did in order that we could be saved. He went to that cross to pay the price of our sins. He died for us. He was buried and three days later came out of the grave, showing his power over death, which was Satan's strongest uh, weapon and his greatest fear that he could bring in people's lives. Jesus said, I've conquered it. You don't have to fear death any longer. You don't have to be afraid. I paid the price of sin. I was buried. I came forth from that grave to show victory over everything that Satan might have. Over sin, over death. And then he shows what we've done to be saved. For when we trust Jesus as our Savior, we die to self. And we bury that old self. And we're raised to a new life in Jesus Christ. The Bible puts it this way. That like as we are buried with him in baptism, even so we are raised to a new life in Christ. So that's what the experience is. It is a picture of what Jesus did that we could be saved and of what these individuals have done to be saved. Otherwise, it's just being put under the water. It's not a really a baptism. And if you've been saved and you've been baptized, then you understand. And I hope it is a reminder to you of that experience that you had, a time of just drawing you back to that moment of remembrance when you first trusted Jesus. And where have you gone since then? I hope you've grown in the Lord. And I hope you're still growing and that every day we'll grow closer to Him and be used of Him as He wants to use us. So this morning, we begin with Rebecca Garner, who will be baptized. And we're thankful for not only family, but friends and our church family who are here for her today, too as we're thankful. And Rebecca, you were just hearing what I shared, and uh, a reminder to you as well as to Wes, who's waiting on the other side of the things about baptism. But I also like to remind the candidates that God is always with you. Don't ever forget that. Just as these waters will surround your body in just a moment, God's presence will not only surround you, but he will be with you each and every day of your life. And so it's in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and because of your profession of faith in Him that I now baptize you, Rebecca Garner, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that I now baptize you, Wesley Dunham, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. precious thing it is whenever we see children baptized and, and become uh, Christ followers. And Lord, we thank you that they got so much of life to live now ahead of them, to be an influence in their families, to be an influence in, uh, in their school, to, to be an influence in the jobs that they have or wherever they may go. We just thank you for them. Thank you for their families. And we just pray, Lord, you'd use them in a special way. But as a church family, Lord, help us to help them grow in knowledge and wisdom of you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name because we love him. Amen.
from here. Glad you're here. I thought I was on all the time in the baptistry, but you have to be careful when you're teaching Sunday school and then you're going back to the office and everything. You want to make sure that you have these things turned off in between, but I thought I turned it back on. But uh, anyway, glad you're here. Hope and pray that you're having a good morning. Do pray for these who were baptized as they grow in the Lord. And if you're a guest of ours, we hope you will fill out the flap that's on the bulletin. Drop that in the offering plate, just the flap. It'll carry off easily uh, when, it come, when the offering plate comes by and it'll be our way of having a record of your attendance with us. But we want to stand and greet each other in the Lord. And if you're a sixth grader and under, come join us down at the front, if you don't mind, during the time of welcome. this morning. I'm going to have to start turning my chair this way. I don't know. Girls, have y'all done something over here where the guys don't want to come over here? I don't know what. But I hope you've had a good week, and I'm glad that you're here today. How many people saw a painted rock or two laying around the church this morning? Anybody see a painted rock or two? That's something that, that's, that's kind of going around, and I'm not sure what it's called. I think there's a Facebook page called Washita Rocks or something, and people are, are painting rocks in, in different ways, and some of our church members painted these. Am I supposed to say who, Tina and TJ? 
Did y'all want to keep it a secret? Just tell me if you do, okay? Tell me if you want it to be a secret, and I won't say, Logan, who did it, and Thomas. But uh, I just announced it. Oh, I'm sorry. But the object is, and I've seen them in other places, and I didn't know you were supposed to take them and move them. But you can take them if you see a painted rock, and, and you can take it and move it and place it somewhere else and go on that Facebook page and put a hint to where the rock is and all. It's just kind of a thing that, that keeps our community together. It's fun when you have things that, that everybody is working on together and that. And that's what we hope as Christians that we're doing is we're going out sharing Jesus with others, that we're working together. But I was thinking about Jesus this morning. Do you think that God was proud of him? Do you think that God was proud? He was. There's a verse in the Bible in Matthew. It says, and this was after Jesus was baptized. And it said, a voice came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So God said that he was pleased with Jesus. And why do you think that he was pleased with him? John Payton? He kept God in his cart. Jesus grew. There's a scripture in the Bible that says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. Y'all know it? And in favor with God and men. That meant that as Jesus grew, he kept close to God. But he also was treating other people and being the kind of person he should. And that means he also was growing in knowledge and understanding of things as he, you know, I think about when Jesus, did he have to learn to read or did he just know how? Yes. Yes, he was. You know, did he have to, to, to let them sit down and teach him the letters of the Hebrew alphabet or, or did you think he just already knew it? That's one of the things I've always, did he know math? Or did somebody have to teach him? You know, because it says he grew in wisdom. But, you know, it was important for that. And, you know, our parents like us to be respected by other people. They like other people to, to like their children and, and for you to be respected by them as they're training and teaching you. But I think that the main reason God was proud of Jesus was because that Jesus did what God sent him to do. Okay, I talk better when y'all are looking at me instead of the screen, okay? Y'all go home and watch it on, on the internet. But Jesus did what God sent him to do. If your parents ever asked you to do something and you didn't do it, don't answer that because we all did it. We all did it. And it's always through the generations going to happen. But Jesus wasn't that way. He did what God wanted him to do. And it made his father proud of him. In fact, he said, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. You know, when we trust Jesus as our Savior, we become a member of the family of God. And when baptism, like today, of course, we've talked a lot about how baptism doesn't save us. It just kind of shows outwardly kind of a symbol of what has taken place in our heart. It's kind of like when someone is adopted and they have a ceremony and they're adopted and they sign the paperwork. Well, you know, the ceremony doesn't mean that they're adopted. Just like the baptism doesn't mean that we're a Christian. It's just a symbol of what takes place as we are in the kingdom of God and we've become a child of God. And even then, we want to make God proud of us. We want to continue to do the things that God wants us to do to honor him, just like hopefully we want to honor our parents in the same way. So remember that as you're making decisions each day and doing things. And of course, the biggest decision you'll ever make is when you pray and ask Jesus into your heart. And from then on, you know he's with you always and will help you through everything. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for your love for us. And God, we do pray that you would help us to do your will in everything we do, God, so that you can be proud of us. Lord, not so we can show others how good we are, but to glorify and to praise you and to bring honor and glory to you. 
And Lord, I pray for these children as they're growing and learning each day. And God, that they'll continue to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And as they become the, the Christian adults that you would have them to be, God, that everything that we teach them as a church family will lead them in that direction. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. deacons come forward for the morning offering certainly we're thankful for what God's blessed us with and let's bow in a prayer of thanksgiving and James would you lead us please sir gracious heavenly father we come to you this morning we thankful Lord for the opportunity to come out and worship you in your house this morning Lord we just pray that you be with brother Smith as he brings a message of the morning Lord we thank you for these two young adults that have been baptized this morning and help us as a church, Lord, to, to uh, stand beside them and and try to show them the way that's right to, to, to go before you. Lord, we just uh, remember the sermon that Brother Smith preached a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we we just pray, Lord, that, that we would not be the great pretenders, uh, but but do what you would have us to do, Lord, and follow, follow your will. Lord, we just give you all the praise and the glory and ask you to forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. As we're going through the book of Romans, it's important for us to keep in mind the, the historical context of the book. That's something we have a lot of difficulty with today. A lot of people don't like to study history. Uh, there seems to be more and more of it since I'm getting older. Have you noticed that? Since you've studied history in school, for some of you at least, there's more history now than there was then. And it's going to be that way every day, isn't it? In fact, uh, you have to read some of the answers the kids have put on tests uh, in answering questions that were asked in the history classes. And, and these come from Bible history as well as secular history, either in high school or in college. I'm just going to share a few of them with you. It said, Moses led the Hebrew slaves to the Red Sea where they made unleavened bread, which is bread without any ingredients. And another answer to a question, Moses went up on top of Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. He died before he ever reached the land of Canada. Solomon had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. The Greeks were a highly sculptured people, and without them we would not have history. The Greeks also had many myths. A myth is a, is a female moth. Okay? Uh... In the Olympic Games, Greeks ran races, jumped, and hurled the biscuits and threw the java. Eventually, the Romans conquered the Greeks. History calls the people Romans because they never stayed in one place very long. In an age of great inventions and discoveries, Gutenberg invented the Bible. Another invention was the circulation of blood. I'm glad somebody came up with that one, aren't you? Circulation of blood? Anyway, uh... Another, the greatest writer in the Rena of the Renaissance was William Shakespeare. He was born in the year 1654, supposedly on his birthday. He wrote tragedies, comedies, and hysterectomies. Another great author was, <laughs> another great author was John Milton. Milton wrote Paradise Lost, then his wife died and he wrote Paradise Regained. <laughs> These are actual answers on history questions. Another, Abraham Lincoln became America's greatest precedent, P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T was what they put. Lincoln's mother died in her infancy, and Lincoln was born in a log cabin that he built with his own hands. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves by signing the Emasculation Proclamation. On the night of April the 14th, 1865, Lincoln went to the theater and got shot in his seat by one of the actors in a moving picture show. The believed assassinator was John Wilkes Booth, an insane actor. This ruined Booth's career. <laughs> well, if you've ever taught history, which I have, I, I've seen a few of those kinds of answers. But I want to remind you of the historical context of, the, of Romans and, and chapter 3, where, we're, where we are beginning today. Paul grew up in the Jewish religion. He was an expert on it. He had studied greatly. He was one of the, the leaders of the Pharisees. Uh, he, he was a scholar in, in that he knew what he was talking about. And, and for many years, he served as the chief prosecutor and persecutor of the Christian faith. But when he became a Christian, he then became one who defended the Christian faith like no other. And in chapter 1, he talks about how man without any kind of religion uh, or, or religious background, these Gentile gen, uh, pagans, as they were known by Jews, uh, were terribly sinful. That's what he deals with in chapter 1 as he's asking the question, is there any hope for them? Any hope for them to be saved? These who are or uh, in, in the pagan world and, and living these kinds of lifestyles. And I'm sure the Jewish people thought, boy, give it to them. Those are the kind of people they are. They are greatly sinful. 
But then he turned in, uh, in what we have as chapter 2 and, and came down hard on the religious people, on these Jewish people who all it was was religion for them. They were trust, trusting in their Jewish religion to get them to heaven. It's the same as we spoke two weeks ago about us trying to trust in our Baptist religion or our Protestant religion, uh, all of those kinds of things. None of that is going to get you to heaven. That's where he aims his biggest guns on religion. And now as he comes to chapter 3, he synthesizes these two in trying to make a definite point. And that point is summarized in the ninth verse of chapter 3 where he says, What shall we conclude then? Here's the conclusion of it all. What shall we conclude then? Are we, speaking about Jews, are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. That's the point he's trying to make, and he's developing it in the next several chapters. Having said all of that in the preceding eight verses, as we'll look at in just a moment, he comes to the point of saying uh, that this brilliant legal mind, he's already coming up with the objections they're going to have to what he said, and he's going to overrule those objections, kind of like in a court of law. Some of you might remember watching uh, Matt Locke or Perry Mason, and they have reruns of those today, uh, so some of you younger folks can even see that. But they get to a certain point in the, in the court proceedings, and one of those lawyers would speak up and say, Objection, Your Honor. And of course, they would listen for the objection, and he would say either objection sustained, which meant you've made a, a good point, and we sustain that objection. Our objection overruled, meaning you didn't make a good point, and we overrule, and that prosecutor can go ahead and, and uh, share whatever it is he wants to say. Well, that's what Paul's doing in these particular verses that we're looking at this morning. He is looking at the questions that people would ask. And they were, these were objections that they had to the things that Paul has just said in chapters 1 and 2. And he's going to overrule those objections with the arguments of God as we're going to see. So we come to the first of these. Objection number one, there is no value in being religious. Now that's what we've just dealt with two weeks ago in the message, because last Sunday we did the Lord's Supper. But it's also what Paul dealt with in the second chapter of Romans. He's saying your religion doesn't save you. Being religious, going through all the religious jargon, all, none of that's going to save you. So their objection was, well, then there's no value in being religious then. But look at verses 1 and 2 to see how he answers this objection. First he poses the question, and then he answers it. He says, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Remember, that was the mark of a relationship with God for the Jewish people. We could say, for us today, in, in response to what Paul just said, what value is there in going to church? Or what value is there in reading the Bible? Or what value is there in going to Sunday school? That was virtually what they were saying. And Paul is posing that question. But he answers it in verse 2. Is it valuable? He says, much in every way. First of all, they, speaking of the Jews, have been entrusted with the very words of God. Now the questions or the ob objection is this. Okay, I believe you, he's saying. Being religious will never get anybody to heaven. Paul, you've already told us that. So, what sense does it make to even go to church then or to read your Bible or to go to school, Sunday school? Isn't being baptized just a, a religious act? Why should we be baptized? It won't get you into heaven. Walking down an aisle and filling out a form, that's a religious act. So that won't get you into heaven either. We know all of that. Well, religion is empty. That's what Paul was saying to them in chapter 2. But Paul is saying when they ask the question then, well, then what value is any of that? He said as it has great value. Why? You have been given God's Word. That's the value of it. Here's the ruling he made from heaven. God has given you His written Word. Therefore, you cannot claim ignorance to His will. 
That's the objection. And here's how he overrules it with the answer. You see, going to church will never get anyone into heaven. Well, why do I go to church? Why do I go to Sunday school? Well, I'll tell you at least one good reason. You're exposed to the Bible when you go. When you go to Sunday school, you're exposed to the Word of God as it's being taught. When you come to worship, you're exposed to the Word of God because as we open the Bible, we say, this is what God's Word says to us. It is a special word. That means, uh, the, the King James Version says, the oracles of God, which is a special word meaning finished, written down, revelation of God. It's the finished, written down, revelation of God's Word, His written down revelation. There's nothing spiritual or holy or supernatural about this book. It, it's, it's got words on it. What makes it special? It's God's Word to us. That's what makes it special. It's God speaking to your heart and mine. What we need to know about God can be found within the pages of the Bible. What we need to know about God's will for our life can be found in the pages of the Bible. I believe this Bible is all we need today to know God's will for our lives as well as to know how we ought to live and behave. Look at Romans 15, 4. This is what the Bible says about itself. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. You see, we couldn't have church if we didn't have the Bible. Couldn't have Sunday school. We're not gathered here just to share our opinions. Yeah, that's not why we come to Sunday school, to share our opinions. It's not why we come to worship. The purpose of our coming is to be exposed to God's Word, and He does have a Word for you and me for our lives and for living. It's His inspired Word, the inspired Word of God. A lady from NOW, which is the National Organization of Women, was being interviewed on television uh, a couple of years ago. And she, here's her statement. Well, of course that's what the Bible says. Now, that was concerning marriage and family. She said, of course that's what the Bible says. She didn't disagree, but she went on to say, but that was written for a different century, for a different culture, and for a different civilization. And she says it has absolutely no impact on the American culture today. Now, that was her view of the Bible. And I'm sure it's the view of other people, too. But I want you to know, if you ignore the Word of God, there's coming a day when you're going to wish you had viewed it differently and you had taken God seriously because when you stand before Him to give an account of your life, it's not going to be what your opinion or the opinions of others was concerning life and living and what you ought to be doing. It's going to be concerning His Word. There are no surprises when it comes to Judgment Day. It's all right here. He's going to ask, what have you done with what I said for you to do. First of all, what have you done with what I said for you to do concerning my relationship with you and your relationship with me? And what have you done concerning life and living as far as what I have given you as the way to live and how to do things? If we've ignored it, you're going to flunk the test on that day. And there's no retaking it. There's no going back and having another opportunity to do differently. On that day, it's the final grade. And he's either, either going to say, enter, well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. And it's all here. You can, you can listen to anybody's opinion about the Bible that you want to, even that woman who was spouting this out on television, but that doesn't matter. She's not going to be your judge one day. And no one else is except God who gave us his word and said this is my guide for you to get to know me as well as a guide for life and living. Truly, God's Word is special. You want to know the value of being religious? At least you have the Word of God written down for you and you are exposed to it. That's what Paul is saying. Do you really hunger for His Word? How many of you have at least one Bible in your home? Anybody not have one? Probably you have more than one. The question is, have you read it? 
Robert Summer, in a book he wrote in the early 1900s called The Wonder of the Word of God, shared a story about a man who was severely injured in an explosion. It blinded him and messed up his face and his hands and his arms greatly. He, the thing that bothered him the most is he couldn't read the Bible. Braille had just come along a few years before that, and he thought maybe he could learn Braille, but there were the, the burns from the explosion were so severe he had no feeling, no nerves in the ends of his fingers. He could not feel the Braille. He heard about somebody who could touch Braille, the raised knobs with their lips and could read Braille that way, but he had no feeling in his lips and could not do it that way. He learned Braille with the touch of his tongue. He learned the letters of Braille. And Robert Summers shared that that man had a, a desire to read God's Word so much that before he died, he read through the Bible four times using his tongue reading Braille. Now, I don't know what that does to you, but it brings conviction in my heart. I've got eyes, I've got hands, and I can read. If somebody wanted to read the Bible that greatly what does it say about you and me if we don't read God's word I pray that there is a hunger he said blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness that means God's way and the only way you're going to know that is through his word and if you are going to have that hunger and thirst after righteousness you're going to have to read in order to know his will and and there's no excuse for us not to read the bible we're able to read. We're able to see. God has given us, you know, we've been blessed. That man truly had a desire to read, even to the point of learning Braille with his tongue. Objection number two. God hasn't been faithful to, to me. That's why I sin. These people were saying, concerning, and we'll get to this question in just a minute. God hadn't been faithful. That's why I sin. Look at verses 3 and 4. And this is what Paul is asking. They're, the question, what if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Here's the answer. Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar as it is written so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Now that last quotation, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge, comes from Psalm 51. King David had been convicted of adultery and murder, and he was saying, God, I have sinned against you. I have been unfaithful to you, but you have been faithful to me in spite of it. Here's the objection, Paul is addressing here. There were some people, just like there are people today, who say, I don't go to church today because God failed me. God was unfaithful to me at some point. And I've just turned my back on God because He wasn't there for me. I'm not going to be there for Him either. And that's why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and living the way that I'm living. I even had one person ask one time, said, where was God when my son died? All I could say is the same place he was when his son died. You see, God gave up his only son for you and for me. And the answer truly is that he is there all the time. The objection Paul overrules by saying God is faithful and true. Therefore, you cannot blame your sin on him. That's what he's saying in verse 3. He's faithful. Verse 4, he said he's true. Therefore, you can't blame, blame your sin on him. God's always been faithful to keep the promises he's made to us. He's never failed on one of his promises. We try to characterize, you know, think about faithfulness and, and characterize people of either being faithful or unfaithful. But you know, it's either an all-in or nothing at all, isn't it, when you think about being faithful? Think about it. If a wife's asked her husband, said, have you been faithful to me throughout our marriage? And he said, well, I've been 80% faithful. Oh, wait a minute, I've been 95% faithful. 
or 99% faith. Is that being faithful? Even 99%? Would you agree that's still not being faithful? You see, it's either all in or not at all, isn't it? And Paul is saying God is faithful. That's what he's saying in verse 3. And he is true. That's what he's saying in verse 4. He's faithful to us. Have you ever noticed the tendency of people to try to excuse the sins of their life? We try to blame God for making us the way we are. James 1.13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. All that means is, when I sin, I can't blame God. Human nature is to try to justify our behavior, try to blame somebody else for the, uh, and come up with an excuse for why we do what we've done. But you know, the, an excuse is simply the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Think about it. Maybe a little bit of truth there. It's the skin of a reason or the skin of truth stuffed with a lie. We always try to make excuses. Ask any policeman who stopped someone for speeding. My speedometer was broken. Or I was driving the same speed as everybody else around me. Why'd you pick on me? <laughs> that doesn't work too well either. If you, I haven't heard that. I'm taking this from what policemen have said. I haven't. <laughs> Or the one that the policeman shared that he had never heard before, and, and it just got to him. He stopped this, this lady. He said, ma'am, did you know you were driving 60 miles an hour? And this little old lady looked up at him and smiled, and she said, that's impossible, Sonny. I haven't been gone an hour. He said he thought about that just a moment and told her, ma'am, bless your heart. Slow down and keep going. And he didn't even give her a ticket. You might want to try that sometime if you need it. I haven't even been gone an hour. But you know, that's what we do. We try to come up with excuses of all kinds. And you can read those and find others on, on your websites. But Adam and Eve started it off, didn't they? First game ever invented was the blame game. Adam and Eve had sinned there in the garden. God had put them there in this in perfect environment. Everything was what they needed. He, God said, you can enjoy all of it. Take care of it. Enjoy everything that's here except one tree I've got right in the middle of the garden. Leave that one alone. That one's mine, not for anybody else to touch. Leave it alone. Of course, guess which one they went to. Went to that one. Eve was enticed by the, the snake, the serpent. She ate. She got Adam to eat. God came walking in the garden. Adam, where are you? Every day before that, they had been out there waiting for him, wanting to talk with him, and now they wanted to hide. Where are you, Adam? God knew where he was, but he wanted Adam to admit it. What have you been doing, Adam? Why did you eat that fruit? What? God, it was that woman, that woman you gave me. You wives, anytime your husband wants to blame you, know that he got it from Adam. It, you know, it goes all the way back. They started it. Or he, Adam started it. It was that woman you gave me, God. She's the one who, who, who caused me to do that. Well, Eve, why did you do it? Well, that was that serpent, that old snake. He tempted me, and I, and I ate. You see, Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake, and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. Blaming everybody else for that which we've done. Truly. It needs to be as Paul was saying. We can't blame anybody else for our sin. You have to admit, I'm a sinner. I was made this way. It's not God's fault. God, I've sinned, and I need your forgiveness. And that brings us to objection number three. The more evil I do, the better God appears in comparison. The more evil I do, the better God appears in comparison. Look at verses 5 through 8. Here's the question that people were asking. But if our righteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, see the objection I just mentioned? 
if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath upon us? I'm using a human argument here. Now, Paul was actually admitting, he said, you know, this isn't God's word that he's sharing. He said, I'm using an, a human argument in this objection. And then he goes on to say, certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Now, let me just paraphrase what he, what he was saying there. Some people are saying, God's so truthful, and I'm such a liar, that every time I lie, it just makes God look that much better. Isn't that right, they were saying? And Paul says, that's ridiculous. And here are his words, though. Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Then Paul's answer, their condemnation is deserved. <laughs> is that they don't deserve anything but to be condemned by God. If that's the kind of excuse you're going to make, I've got work news for you, Paul said. That's not going to hold water. You deserve the condemnation. You see, there are actually people today who believe that they can set their own rules for living. I don't have to pay attention to what God says for me. I can do what I want to do. And you can. You can do what you want to do. But just be aware of the fact that you're going to give answer for what you do as well. I mean, you have every right. God gave each of us free will. He'll never make us do anything. But he wants us to serve him. He wants us to love him. But he gives us the right to do whatever we want to do. The only problem is you don't compare yourself to God. He's not the standard you know, you, you can't say, well, I'm as good as God or I'm not as good as God. You can't make that kind of comparison. Uh, God has a totally different sta value standard than we do. And uh, you make a mistake if you compare yourself to anybody else. We're to be compared to ourselves. Kind of like the little boy that had a puppy dog he wanted to sell. Told his mama one morning, I'm going to go sell my little puppy. He, it was a cute dog, and, and uh, she said, well, how much are you going to ask for? He said, $10,000. She smiled, and she said, well, you know, good luck. Well, he left the house, came back before noon. He didn't have his puppy dog. He said, I sold my dog. His mama said, well, how much did you have to cut? How much did you get for it? He said, I got $10,000. He said, well, not exactly. He said, I traded it for two $5,000 cats. You know, how do you how do you compare? See, it's kind of like our trying to compare ourselves to God. It's no comparison. You're comparing yourself to anybody else. It won't work. It's a totally separate set of values. Some people say, "Well, every time I lie, it just makes God look that much more truthful." That's the argument they were giving. Have you ever noticed when a jeweler brings a ring out of the the case? To show you, they always put a piece of black velvet under it. Looks better that way, doesn't it? Than just on that old glass top case that they've just taken it out of. Oh, it'll shine and sparkle and everything else when compared to the blackness of that velvet. That's the argument Paul is refuting. There were people who were saying that God's goodness is enhanced when you look at it in the backdrop of my great sinfulness, when you see how bad I am, then that makes God look better. So you might as well live it up. I'm doing God a favor by sinning, is what they were saying. And Paul says that's a lame excuse. That's ridiculous. Those of you who know history or theology will recognize the term that's been around ever since the first century called antinomianism. It means the Greek word for nomos is no laws. No laws. Anti means against laws. Against. Those were people, there were people in Paul's day who were just saying, I don't have to live by any rules. 
I don't have to live by any standards. I can do what I want to do. Now, people don't go around today saying, hey, I'm antinomian. Most of them don't even know the word. But they put on their shirts things like, no rules, no fear, no limits. All kind of sayings on their shirts that say virtually the same thing. I can live any way I want to. I don't have to live by anybody else's standards. Here's the ruling that Paul makes against that. Ruling, God is righteous. He can't be more righteous. Your excuse of trying to say that that your blackness of sin is going to make him look better, he's already righteous. You can't make him any more righteous. And therefore, unless you repent, you will not escape condemnation. That's his answer to that. We would all do well to listen to what the writer of Hebrews said when he wrote, How shall we escape if we neglect or ignore such a great salvation? Is there any escape for Is there any excuse? He was saying, No, there is none. No excuse at all. The bottom line, God is holy, and he must punish sin. We're sinful in one way or another. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. If there was any time when God would have wanted to be light on sin, it would have been when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Because he took upon himself your sins and mine, and to see his son on that cross, if there was any time when he wanted to go light on sin, it would have been then. But the Bible says he turned his back on his son because sin had to be paid for, and it was the only way it could be paid for. Jesus had cried out in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, let this cup pass from me. In other words, if there's any other way that we can accomplish the salvation of people except by the cross, let's do it. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And there was no other way. That's why Jesus cried out from the cross, Why have you forsaken me? Because he felt that separation at the back of God had been turned to him. Because sin is that bad, it's that horrible, it requires death in order to pay for it. (coughs) Required the death of his son to pay the price for your sins and mine. You will either face the judgment of God on your own, or you'll face the judgment of God standing where Jesus stood, at the cross. There's a great story from the settlement of the West that illustrates this. When they were settling the West and they would have their little houses and lean-tos and everything else, the one thing they feared the greatest were those wildfires that would come rushing across the prairies. You could see it in the distance as the smoke would rise. And you knew what was happening, and initially, all they knew to do was to grab what few things they could and to try to run from the fire before it got there. Once it had passed by, they would go back to just charred remains of what was there. But they finally realized there's another way. We can fight fire with fire. And then when they saw the the smoke rising as they knew that the the fire was raging across the prairie again, they would go out and around the perimeters of their place, they would start fires and let it burn back away from it. We call it setting backfires today. And let it burn back away from it. And then they would get to their house and they would stay right there and the fire would come up to them and go around them and keep going. They were spared by standing where the fire had been. That's how we can stand when we face the judgment of our sins. Stand in the place of the cross where the fire has already been, where the price has already been paid. Stand firm with Jesus, not because we are good, not because we don't deserve the death that comes from sin, but because of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for our sins that we've accepted. That's how we can stand and miss the judgment of God as it will go on only because of Him. Throughout all of history, the only place, 
The fire of God's judgment against sin has fallen is at the cross. And that's the only place of safety today. Will you trust him if you've never done that? Will you commit your life to him? Because to use these excuses that Paul was was sharing, these objections that people had, I want to tell you, concerning why God hasn't been, he hasn't been faithful to me, I failed to say this a moment ago, but there are times when just know God is faithful and true. We may not understand it. We may still question why things happen. But know that God is faithful and true, and one day we will understand it better. The songwriter put it that way. We'll understand it better by and by. And one day we will. We may not now, but trust him. He's faithful. He's true. Paul was trying to help you realize that as he gave us that ruling and that you cannot blame your sin on him. Will you trust him? Don't use the excuses. Know that being exposed to the word of God is so important, very important, because it's through the word that we can learn of our need and the answer to that need. Know that he's faithful and true, and though we may not understand everything, we can trust him, and he'll show us one day the answer that I couldn't understand right now. I'll understand it better one day. Know that also I can't put God up on a pedestal by doing bad things. I can't make him look better by being worse. It doesn't work that way. Paul said, if that's what you try, you deserve the condemnation you're going to get because there is no excuse for our not trusting the Lord. Stand in the place of the cross, and the fire of his judgment will go around, and you'll be spared, not because you deserve it, but because of what Jesus did, because he loves you and me that much. Would you bow with us in prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us to understand that we may come up with excuses for why we shouldn't do this or can't do that, but it's only an excuse. Your word answers any excuse we might try to come up with because there's no other way but your way. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through you. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning who's never made such a commitment, that they'll make sure today before they ever leave here that they are standing with you at the cross, the place of safety. And if there are any other decisions that need to be made, Lord, speak and give us the courage to do. For it's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen we stand to sing our hymn of invitation as the Holy Spirit leads we invite you to come right now I'll be here at the front to receive you as we sing God will make a way when there seems to be no way God will make a way where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see he will make a way for me he will be my guide hold me closely to his side all you have to do is trust him With love and that's what he said I'll be there for you for if you'll just trust me As we bow our heads together as Robbie continues to sing, if there's any other decision you need to make, trusting him as Savior and Lord of life, moving your membership to go to work with God's people here, surrendering to full-time vocational service, whatever, would you let God have his way right now?
thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you who are our guests today, especially those who came to, to be here for the baptism of your family member or friend. And uh, all of you, thank you for being here. I hope you'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock for our evening worship, choir practice at 5. Uh, we'll end up our series on angels tonight. What about angels in this age in which we're living? What we call the sense in the age of the spirit. What about angels we'll we'll deal with that tonight as we wrap up our series on on angels i hope you'll be here but don't forget to pray for one another as we go from this place of worship that god will have his way in our lives let's bow for closing prayer time of thanking god that we've been able to be here even this day unless holly would you lead us please in prayer